Okay, um, it's three minutes past four. So we're going to start this webinar today. Uh, we're still trying to find a way to present it. And um, this is the second part of the first webinar we had uh, last week on the 18th. So today we'll have the same speakers, Professor Gattinoni, Professor Q Melo, and Professor Cam and Dr. Camporota. Uh, they will uh, talk about ARDS management again. And um, I think because we are like a few minutes late in order to allow the people to connect, I will give the room to Professor Gattinoni. So the presentation is yours. Thank you very much for being here again and welcome. Okay, thank you. Buenas tardes, everybody. A cinco de la tarde, no, a cuatro de la tarde. Here are cinco todos los reloes. So, plan protective strategy. Originally, I think uh, it's difficult you to try to find a definition of plan protective strategy. What is that? Uh, and there's not a precise definition because for somebody it's just a lower tidal volume. Lower, when you use lower, higher means that we do not know anything uh, because uh, we have a qualitative uh, judgment uh, why we have to do usually in the life with the quantitative aspects and to keep the lung open. But I think the first one who used the term protective strategy was my friend uh, Amato in uh, uh, many several years ago and then with Lachman we introduced uh, strongly the concept of uh, open the lung so high pressure is on and keep the lung open is all this true and what you've learned recently with COVID and so on let's see very try to in the next 25 minutes to cover this topic uh, or to give my view on this topic so protective mechanical ventilation, protecting what? The patient from the doctors, the lung from the injury. Uh, usually she should be protected from ventilator induced lung injury. Now we have, uh, these are the, the main, uh, main thing when we play with a ventilator with a tidal volume. This is the magic six milliliter tidal volume for ideal body weight, uh, remember that. Second, the protective effect of uh, PDV is that true at which level is always true. Second, this component is completely neglected. Nobody cares about the respiratory rate. Uh, even in the ARMA triad, we had a respiratory rate going from 15, uh, 12, to, uh, 12 to 30. And uh, what the COVID asset uh, told us. And so I think I will cover uh, briefly all these aspects. Okay, this is the ARMA trial. Everybody has seen this diapo uh, 3,000 times. The people usually uh, forget uh, um, a few things. First, forget that the trial was interrupted by the ethical committee, not from the, from the monitor, uh, the safety board uh, monitoring because of manifest superiority because the planning was to go for more than 700 patients. And uh, maybe uh, we forget uh, something like this, that before the RDS net, uh, look at the separation of six versus 12, 39.8 the mortality in control treated group 31, significant. But before that, we had several randomized trials. Here, look. Seven versus ten and a half of it every. Treated group, the treated low tidal volume, forty-six percent, thirty-seven nine percent. It happens not to be significant. Stewart, this was brochure. My friend Stewart did the seven versus eleven, fifty versus forty-seven. Brower, fifty versus forty-six. Let's see the ARMA trial, because as far as I know, maybe it's a legend, but the day before the presentation of the protocol to the regulatory agency, somebody decreased a little bit this one or increased a little bit this one, because I'm positive if you would do six versus 10, as originally planned, that maybe nobody would speak about the other volume today. So, these are the plateau pressures. 
And you see that uh, in most of the studies, uh, we have a quite big overlap. Per kilo, what does it mean per kilo? This is the ideal body weight, and this is the total gas volume that we measure in the patients with mild, moderate, and severe RDS. And you can see there is no relationship at all between the gas on which the V is exerted, which is the lung, this is the lung dimension, and the ideal body weight. The people who invented the ideal body weight was thinking a sort of normalization of the total volume per the body weight of the individual. But what is induced here is not the tidal volume versus the body weight, but is the tidal volume versus the lung size, baby lung instead of eye lung. And this uh, six of tidal volume, this one paper of uh, Ranieri, group uh, many years ago, that we find even with six tidal volume in some patient here with very low recruitability, you see we have some problem. If you have recruitability, you have other picture again. So that means uh, that in magic number, six tether volumes, maybe it's not the appropriate way to take care of the patient. And uh, what is important is the stress strain in terms of ventilator-induced lung injury. This, uh, that piece uh, in, in physiology, the stress is the transpulmonary pressure. And the strain is how much, how much the tidal volume change, not really the respiratory lung volume, but the FRC, I mean the resting lung volume. Because the tidal volume plus the PEEP volume, I have to correct this slide, divide the FRC, this is the strain. And this is the stress. And there's a lead to one proportionality constant, which is uh, called a specific elasticity. And uh, in men uh, is around uh, 12, even in the RDS. That means uh, that when you have a FRC of one liter, a tidal volume of uh, one liter, and you read 12 centimeter of water, this is the specific elasticity. Is the pressure, at which the resting volume double is size. So the RDS lung is uh, small, it's not stiff. And of course, if we have a normal strain is about zero two, in RDS one, one, one is still okay, because one seems, uh, the lung is very resistant very resistant to induce really damage in experimental animals, which the only way we have to really study the villi, because the villi manifestation of the RDS are so similar that it is impossible to exactly quantify the amount of villi in men. But with experimental animals, you can do that. And we found very clearly that when the strain is greater than 1.5, you have a disaster below up to 48 hours at a frequency of 15, you still have a, a problem. And this is an example of tidal volume per kilo. These are tidal volume per kilo, six, the magic number of six, you know, and we have a patient with RDS, a patient with uh, just uh, acute lung injury, so better. Fit. But look here, for the six milliliters of tidal volume, your strain may go from 0 0.4, absolutely innocent, to 1.8, which is a killer. And these six milliliters of tidal volume. Sometimes you may go, we give 10 milliliters of tidal volume and still have a strain, which is absolutely, absolutely okay. So even a tidal volume per kilo, be careful and try to measure the FRC. There are several respirators now in which the option to measure the lung volume is available. Now, oh, oh, let's see. Excuse me, from vocabulary.
Okay. Uh, sorry. Yeah? Okay. Good. Here is an example. This is the FRC, the resting volume. This is a tidal volume. But don't forget the peak volume. And when you have, when you reach this part, uh, the strain cannot be tolerated. But this is about two up to three times the values of FLC. And when you have this condition, the problem is. So one of the problems of the driving pressure, the driving pressure, the pressure which is linked to the tidal volume, the driving pressure, let's say 15, ignore how much is the starting pressure. The driving pressure of 15 is different if it's applied with 5 of PIP or with 20 of PIP. So these are the relevant down volume. And you see what's happened to the strain. You see these small things here. The strain, the, the lesion in experimental strain appear around the land here. This after 10, 15 hours. And these are the end. At the beginning, you have just the CT scan to see. Here, you can see some McLam mechanics the gas exchange is perfectly okay. Still, perfect is not too much, but this is okay. Here you have a problem with the gas exchange. And this is an example in animals uh, when you see with the drive impression here was maintained similar here to here. And we were increasing progressive the PEEP, lower PEEP and higher PEEP. And you see that you have a new shape lower peep below in this healthy animal below seven four to seven was not good at all but higher than 10 uh, was uh, very very bad so also what is protective protective may be considered peep uh, sufficient to keep to give some endospiratory pressure to prevent something worse as a telectasy but not too much because we have, uh, when you use high PEEP uh, or lower PEEP, uh, we compare the possibility of atelic trauma, that means low PEEP, uh, atelic trauma, high PEEP, uh, volo trauma. And we have how it distributed the stress, uh, but the mortality, how is different here? And we have, my dear friends, at least three big studies that showing that if you play the P between five and 15 and you take all the patients with RDS, so what we call classical or general RDS, the population at which this, this study were applied, you don't see any difference. That means atrial trauma and lower trauma are equivalent, but, but if you go at higher P, volume trauma wins is worse the volume trauma than, and you have a significant increase of mortality. And remember, so when in a randomized study, that's something which is significant, the sickness is extremely strong. So I think that if you want to protect the wheel, you don't have only tidal volume of P, you have to the pressure, volume, flow, respiratory rate, and P. All these are summarized in one variable which is the mechanical power. Here we gave the same mechanical power, the same package of energy to the lamp per minute. You see 20 joule, 20 joule, 20 joule. Here, the mechanical power was with, with tremendous peep, uh, tremendous tidal volume, 30 milliliters per kilo in one group, 10 in another group, five in another group, okay? But uh, here the Respiratory rate was extremely high, and here the PIP was high. So in three different groups, had the same package of mechanical power, but you, or to the tidal volume, or to the respiratory rate, or to the PIP. Which were the difference? These are land weight and weight to dry ratio. We have exactly the same thing. But the worst of this group in terms of hemodynamic was a PIP. So here we have uh, the classical, how the lag is made in RDS. We have 
part of the land which is smaller and which is called baby land. And so far, what I have all presented is a classic LDS, baby land. This part of the land is out of business. This is a normal land, a good land. What about COVID? This is the baby lung. This is not a baby lung. We have more than, almost three liters of lung. Pure 295. Here, the same patient. I presented already, but this was a friend of mine. And I think teach to me these lies more than many other things in uh, all this uh, soup of the LDS. And so this is the baby lung as we talk at the beginning. But where is the baby land here? I have to use the same philosophy of using tidal volume, peep, and so on, in this land and in that land. Both appear as LDS, bilateral infiltrates, low PO2. Both goes under the umbrella of LDS. But the patients are different. This is the amount of gas volume. The gas volume, these are, we selected just 32 patients with COVID, and 32 patients meshed with, uh, uh, with uh, PO2-FIO2, same PO2-FIO2, but they had the just pneumonia, not extra pulmonary RDS. How can we say that is the same thing at the beginning? The gas volume is double in COVID compared to the classical RDS. I don't know how the people may say that these are the same thing. We spoke about uh, this one. I just want to touch tidal volume. It's a so big scandal to not use six milliliters body weight. I told you, I show you what is the relationship between body weight and tidal volume in the classical DS. It's ridiculous, does not exist. Here, six uh, loses completely its uh, meaning. If I have to use six, maybe with 10 of frequency, have a 70 of PCO2, I have a resorption of atelectasis. It's not a good treatment. In this patient, the strain in this stage of the disease is a marginal, probably does not exist. And the PEEP, why to use a very high PEEP? It's different here. At this point, you have the baby lung and not the adult lung, and you apply whatever you have done so far. So if I had to conclude, the protective strategy to me, we have many times to protect from the doctors. We have to protect maybe from an inappropriate use of fluids, an inappropriate use of uh, porosamides. When you have a patient with inflamed lung, if you give one or two liters more per day, the land deteriorates a lot, and the people think that deterioration maybe is due to the progression of the disease, which is not excluded. But before entering and entering intensive care, sometimes the recruitability goes from very marginal to very high. And recruitability means edema, means atelectasis. Greater is the edema, greater is the recruitability. So the only message I can tell you if the protective strategy does not consist of magic numbers, but in proper tailoring, which is a basically look at the mechanical power, not as a number. Who cares about that? But as a concept, means that you have to look tidal volume, you have to look the pressures, you have to look the strain, and you have to look the frequency. The frequency is extremely important. If you have a tidal volume normal, a people almost normal, you have 35 of frequency, it's a disaster. It is an hemodynamic disaster. So properly tailoring means that to have a properly tailored, we means the adequate measurements. And you have to measure everything which is related to the lung, not just to the kilogram per body weight, but look as much as you can to the Plan volumes, and if possible, to see the stress, the lung pressures, that means transpulmonary pressure, which is not an invention for the physiology. 
is something that uh, is deeply implied in the treatment of everyday patient. If we don't measure, we just don't know. And we are happy with that. Thank you for the attention. Thank you very much. Very good, very interesting. Um, so we have one question here. Uh, now for the questions and answers, which is how different is the mechanical ventilation settings between ARDS patients with COVID-19 and H1N1? Is there any difference at all? Well, I think for what I remember, the H1N1, they had a, and a picture of a very low gas volume and they had a lot of, uh, a, a lot of, um, edema and uh, were, were completely different the beginning uh, of the H1N1 compared to the beginning of, uh, of these uh, patients. This patient have a ground glass. I think all the patients I've seen with H1N1 had already a, a classical type of cardiac. That means a baby lung, low compliance, or not high compliance, a lung, a bad uh, they didn't have the big dissociation with it. Maybe some patient with, when we put in a big soup of uh, ARDS with extra pulmonary ARDS at the really beginning, may have something which come from the vessels instead of them from the alveoli. And maybe they have a little bit more gas volume, a little bit better compliance than ARDS. But after two, three days, uh, the classical RDS, pulmonary and pulmonary, they become very similar. So my answer is uh, they are different, SARS and, and, uh, and COVID-19. Very good. Any more questions from the audience? I'm just waiting. You can uh, remember to all the attendees that you can drop your question on the Q and A section, or even if you don't find it, you can Put it in the chat and we can transcribe this question. So please use this opportunity because we have Professor Gattinoni here to ask your questions. Looks like the audience is a bit shy. Or looks like uh, the protective ventilation was an easier topic than we expected. <laughs> It's not complicated. I think there is not a common sense <laughs> yeah. to be introduced. Hmm? Okay, there is one hand. Any more questions, please? Okay, seems like there is no one asking. We are a little bit ahead of time, so we need to wait now for our next speaker. Mm -hmm. Okay, so no more questions from the audience, not at the moment. So, Professor Gattinoni, thank you very much for, for, oh, there is one more. How do you measure mechanical power? Well, mechanical power. We have a little program, uh, a little program in which the mechanical power is the product of tidal volume times the delta, the driving pressure. Okay, volume time, uh, volume time pressure is work. Plus, you have to add the amount. Uh, um, excuse me. First, you have to measure that you start with a motion equation. Huh? So the pressure at any given moment is due to the pressure to move the lung elasticity, the pressure to overcome the resistances, and then the pressure, which is assumed to overcome the peak pressure that you have at the moment. If I have 10 of PIP to move the lung, I have to have at least 10,001. I need some pressure more than PIP, okay? When you have these three topics, PIP, flow and resistances, tidal volume and uh, um, uh, 
excuse me, uh, elastons and tidal volume, we have uh, the three pressures. At this point, you multiply all this pressure times the tidal volume, and you have it with the upper the rather complicate, but uh, you go to Excel, you can uh, design the equation very rapidly and can be immediately implemented uh, in whatever uh, in whatever respirator. I think there is an application probably will come out uh, soon uh, from another group in South America in which it's very easy to. The number, the magic number, we don't have any magic number, but something around 18 joule per minute uh, is, uh, is apparently a, one of the possible threshold of uh, strong attention to be paid. Very good. <clears throat> okay, so we have one more minute. If anyone wants to ask any question for before our next speaker joins. Okay, there are no more questions for the time being. All right. So once again, Professor Gattinoni, thank you very much. Right. Very interesting, very good. This session last week also, actually the feedback from, from the audience was very good for, for last week in, in general. So thank you very much for these two sessions and uh, we will continue we will continue now. We are a little bit ahead of time, which is which is good. It will allow people to to have some more free time later on. So thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Bye bye. Thank you. So now we are waiting for our next speaker to join. Let's allow one minute. Hello, Dr. Camperota, how are you? We have you Professor Cumelo uh, first and uh, yeah. Do you want me to go first to make up time? It's up to you. He told me that he was going to join just in time. Maybe he's busy, I think uh, he, he was quite busy today. But yeah, what I don't want is to change really the order because some people I know that they are connecting according to the topics and, and stuff. So I imagine that Professor Kimelo is connecting anytime right now. Here is, here he is. Thank you very much anyhow. <laughs> Okay, buongiorno. Professor Kimelo, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hello, Hello. With your flag. Yeah. So we are going then to, to go ahead with your next part, uh, which is the bedside assessment. And yeah. I will give you the, the room now. We are a little bit ahead of time, uh, which as I said, is, is not a bad thing, it's good. So we can continue and, um, and that we may have a earlier finish of this session. So I will give you the screen. I think you need to share the screen or maybe yeah. Professor Gattinoni has to stop sharing it. Do you see my screen? Nope. No. Okay, let me, you can try now. Okay. 
There it is. Good. You are muted, just for the record. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. In the next uh, 25 minutes, I will speak about bedside assessment in patient with acute respiratory failure. So here in this figure is what's happened in patient with RDS. Patient with RDS are characterized by a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So Mm, there are usually bilateral alveolar infiltrate. This is a reduction in the langus volume. This is associated with a reduction in compliance. So we have a big problem how to ventilate this patient. So one of the main problem is to avoid to reduce as much as possible the ventilator induced lung injury. The consequence of the presence of bilateral very infiltrate is an alteration in gas exchange. This is associated with in a reduction in oxygenation due to intrapulmonary shunt, an increase in dead space that is referred by an increase in PCO2. And in addition, we, we can also have an impairment in the microcirculation. For example, this is commonly seen in patients with COVID-19. Why we have um, to avoid the ventilator-induced lung injury and what tools we have at bedside to evaluate the patient undergoing mechanical ventilation. This is clear shown in this figure in which there is a clear relationship between the plateau pressure, the driving pressure and the mortality associated to mechanical ventilation. Increasing the plateau pressure, there is significant increasing in the mortality and similarly increases the driving pressure. The cutoff for the driving pressure is around 15 and for plateau pressure is around 20 and start and there is a CT increase up to 30 centimeters of, of water. This one of the most important study uh, which clearly shows that the way in how we ventilate the patient uh, uh, with RDS can significantly affect the mortality. A very simple study, uh, two um, tidal volume, six versus 12 ml, and here are the results. And uh, six ml was significantly associated to a better outcome. However, my friend, it, um, it is not simple, uh, the treatment of um, patient with RDS, because um, we usually set the tidal volume according to the ideal body weight. And the idea is that the ideal body weight is associated to the dimension of the lung. However, in patient with the RDS, this is not true, because we uh, analyze the actual body weight, so the real body weight, or the ideal body weight, and um, the total lung gas volume. And we didn't find any relationship between the two. And this is clearly shown in this figure. We have two patients with RDS, similar severity, but look at CT scan. In this patient at low level of PIP, there is a high amount of consolidation with uh, it is not affected by increasing the PIP. On the contrary, at the same level of PIP in this patient on the right, it, it is present a higher amount of consolidation and atelectasis. But increasing the PIP, there is a dramatic change. So this patient is characterized by a high lung recruitment. On the contrary, in the patient on the left, there is a low potential of recruitment. So how is possible to ventilate this patient with the same tidal volume? And also the consequence of the same tidal volume, and for example, the same level of PIP applied to this patient can be dramatically different. Uh, a possible solution is to evaluate the driving pressure. The drive, what is the driving pressure? The driving pressure is the ratio between the applied tidal volume, so the, the tidal volume applied with the mechanical ventilation, uh, and the compliance of the respiratory system. So is the tidal volume uh, related to the size of the baby lung. To, to have a, a 
available driving pressure, the patient should be deeply sedated with or without paralysis. And the simple calculate at the best side has the difference between the plateau pressure and the PIP during and end inspiratory pause. And why it is important? This, um, this was a very famous retrospective study published in New England Journal of Medicine, analyzed more than 3,000 patients with RDS. Uh, occur and uh, this was the driving pressure and the mortality. Increasing the driving pressure, the, mo the, mo the risk of that significantly increase. And uh, the red zone seems around 40, 50 centimeters of water. But we also have not only to look the driving pressure in a static condition, but for example, by changing people because we can have different result. This was a group of patients in which the driving pressure significantly increase and the increase of driving pressure without any change of PIP was associated to increase in mortality. On the contrary, without changing the driving pressure by increasing PIP, this was not associated to increase in the mortality. On the contrary, by increasing PIP, if this is associated to a reduction in the driving pressure, this is rating in the, in the reduction in the mortality rate. But how is constituted? How is made the respiratory system? The respiratory system is made of lung, which are inside the chest wall. So every time we inflate the lung, we spend a short amount in of pressure to inflate the lung and to inflate the chest wall. So the real pressure which distend the lung is the transpulmonary pressure. Look here on the right and the top. We have a patient ventilated with a very high pressure, for example, 30 centimeters of water. But due to the presence of a very stiff lung, the transport pressure in this patient can be very low because we spend a high amount of pressure not only to inflate the lung, but the majority of the patient is spent to inflate the respiratory system. And the resulting transport pressure can be quite low. This was an observational study in which a group of sedated and paralyzed patient with RDS underwent uh, uh, by maintaining the same tidal volume, different level of PIP. And we measure in the same time, the higher pressure and the transpulmonary pressure. And for example, for a higher pressure of 30 centimeter of water, which is uh, uh, of course a red zone, the transpulmonary pressure can be very different because can range, for example, from 24, 26 centimeter of water to, to 10, 12 centimeter of water. Because the transpulmonary pressure depend on the amount of pressure applied in the respiratory system and the condition of the respiratory system, the ratio between the lung and the total respiratory system elastance. This was one of the first study in which it was measured the respiratory mechanics of the lung and the chest wall. In black are patients with RDS. In green, gray, patient with healthy lung. And as you can see, patient with RDS present a significant impairment on the lung elastance. But what was new from that time is that also, the chest wall was significantly impaired. How this translates in clinical practice? For example, we have two patients, left and right, ventilated with low tidal volume and certain amount of PIP. And we measure during an end inspiratory pause an hour pressure of 30 centimeters of water. But due to the different condition in the lung and the chest wall, here in the left, we have a very stiff lung. 
on the country in the lung, in the right, we have a stiff chest wall. Look here, the transcranial pressure was completely different. In this patient, the transcranial pressure was quite high. On the contrary, in this patient was quite low. So not dangerous in the right and very dangerous in the left. This was tested in an observational study in a very severe RDS with very hypoxemia. All the patients were ventilated with low tidal volume. And the authors evaluate not, not only the end inspiratory plateau pressure, but the transpulmonary pressure. Here are patients who present a very high airway pressure and very high transpulmonary pressure. So it was not considered safe to ventilate with patient according to mechanical ventilation and underwent extracorporeal support. This was a group ventilated with the same tidal volume, same level of PEEP, same end inspiratory highway pressure, but the transport pressure was quite low, 16 compared to 27 centimeters of water. So this suggests that it is possible, for example, to increase PEEP, avoid the ventilator induced lung injury. The PEEP was increased until the plateau pressure reached 25 centimeters of water. And this patient underwent a conventional mechanical ventilation with higher PEEP without any detrimental consequence. Another important point, my friend, is to look at the hemodynamic. Every time we increase the PEEP, we have an increase a decrease in cardiac index due to decrease in the preload. So this translates, for example, in possible splenic hypoperfusion and also possible change in the shunt. So you can have a very high increase in oxygenation, but not due to recruitment, but all, only due to hemodynamic effect. Try to put together the all factors that can be determinants of the ventilator induced lung injury. So we have the tidal volume, the PEEP, the driving pressure, and the respiratory rate and the flow. We suggest to assess at the bed size the mechanical power. The mechanical power is the pressure applied to the respiratory system due to the tidal volume, to the PEEP, consider also the respiratory rate. It is very simple to compute the mechanical power, but we have to use two different equations. If uh, the, the patient is ventilated with volume control ventilation, we have to measure the peak inspiratory pressure, the plateau pressure and the PEEP, and also the tidal volume and the respiratory rate. If the patient is ventilated in pressure control ventilation, we have uh, to consider the PEEP and the delta pressure apply in pressure control and the respiratory rate and tidal volume similar to the equation applied during volume control. And here are the possible effect of changing tidal volume, flow, diving pressure, respiratory rate, and PEEP during control mechanical ventilation. And as you can see, for the same change in percentage of tidal volume and PEEP, you can have a very different effect of mechanical power. So this suggests that every time we play with the knob of the ventilator, we can have and we can produce a significant and uh, possible detrimental effect by increasing the mechanical power. Why it is important to evaluate the mechanical power? Because the mechanical power computer at admission was significantly rate 
was significantly associated to increase in the mortality rate in patients with RDS. The last point that I would like to present is, that is the dead space. What is the dead space? The dead space is the part of inspiration which is not participate to the gas exchange because the alveolar ventilation is due to the respiratory rate product the tidal volume minus the dead space. The total dead space is due to the anatomic dead space. For example, the endotracheal tube, the mask, the alveolar dead space to the condition of the lung and also to the mechanical dead space. So the total dead space is commonly called the physiological dead space. And why it is important? This was an old, an old study, but very important because clearly suggests that the dead space was a risk factor for death in patients with ARDS. What the author assess? The author assess at uh, admission the dead space fraction. And this is the relationship between the dead space fraction and the mortality. By increasing the dead space, this was associated with a significant increase in the mortality. Just a few words of patient with COVID-19. We provide the evidence that uh, the COVID-19 is not a typical RBS. There are two mainly phenotypes. The phenotypes are usually present at admission who present a lower lung weight, a lower lung elastance, lower lung irritability. And by the day, there is a change by typical ground glass at CT scan to a consolidation. And this present an increase in the weight, increase in the last dance, and increase in the lung recovery. But both of them are characterized by a severe impairment in oxygenation. So try to better understand the, the characteristic of the patient. We compare patient with COVID-19 with two groups of patients. A group of patients with RDS without COVID for the same severity in oxygenation. And the same patient with COVID-19 were compared with patient with RDS without COVID presenting the same respiratory compliance. This was the change in the gas exchange by increasing PEEP from low to high level of PEEP. In the three, three groups, by increasing PEEP, this was associated by increasing oxygenation. But look here, patient with COVID-19 by increasing PEEP presented a significantly higher change in plateau pressure, in driving pressure, and significant reduction in compliance, like an over distension. So how are my conclusion? The RDS patient present a great heterogeneity. It is very important to evaluate the respiratory mechanics, but what is more important is to evaluate the change. For example, by changing the PEEP and look by the change in the lung and the chest wall elastance. And also evaluate not only the oxygenation, but the dead space and PCO2. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Kimelo. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so we have some time for question and answers. So if anyone in the audience wants to ask something, please, can you drop it on the Q&A section? We didn't have much activity before. Looks like today is not a very good day. <laughs> okay. 
but I have to insist it's a really good opportunity to do, to ask questions to the experts. So any questions to the Q and A section? Other ways you can post it in the chat if you don't find it. Okay, there is one here. What could be the possible alternative to the increase in sedative and analgesic shortages in the hospital to manage severely ill COVID-19 patients? So can you repeat it because I don't- Yeah, yeah, I, I repeat it again, yeah. What could be, could be the possible alternative to the increasing sedative and analgesic shortages, which means the lackage of analgesic or sedatives in hospitals to manage severely ill COVID-19 patients. Hmm. Hey, my friend, this is a big problem because especially at the beginning, this patient presented a very high respiratory rate and very high distress. And if you, you are not able to control this very high inspiratory effort, you can increase the patient self infected lung injury. And so you can increase the ventilate, ventilation. This, in this case, it's not the ventilator because it's not intubated, it's the ventilator, ventilation induced lung injury. My suggestion is you can try to increase PEEP, but not too high. You can try to increase the respiratory rate, so to reduce as much as possible the respiratory drive of the patient. And of course, you, unfortunately, you should use uh, sedation and analgesia. And if sedation and analgesia is not enough, use courier. Because what we, we saw in March and also today is uh, sometimes it's not enough uh, the high level of sedation to decrease uh, the discomfort of the patient, the, the synchrony and the inspiratory effort. Okay, thank you very much. Any more questions from the audience? Anyone else? Is any safe RR respiratory rate? I don't think I understand this question. Miros, laugh, no, the, please. Uh, if uh, you think about the mechanical power, it's better than uh, to see just uh, a one point of the possible uh, tools uh, that can uh, promote the VILI. My suggestion anyway is not to increase the respiratory rate up to 22 to 25 in controlled mechanical ventilation and also in a spontaneous breathing patient. Okay, I apologize. I didn't understand the, the question. It's safe to increase. All right, uh, any more questions from the audience? No one else, people is feeling shy. All right, so it looks like there is no any other question coming through. All right, so I've got one Professor question. Kimelo. Okay. I just can't post. Um, so you mentioned here that the changes in the partition mechanics are very important. What is the best way to track those changes? Um, because it might happen over a longer period of time. My, my uh, is uh, to test uh, very simple, two different level of people. Low level of people, high level of people without changing the tidal volume. So by measuring the driving pressure is the first point. Then if you put an esophageal balloon, you can also change, you can also track the change in the lung. So driving pressure and lung elastance. Okay, thank you. That means that you are regularly measuring the esophageal pressure in critical ill patients. Yes, in a severe ADS patient, but not only during control mechanical ventilation, 
maybe is more important in patient during assistant ventilation or during CPAP, especially in patients with COVID-19. All right, thank you very much. Okay, any more questions from the audience? Nope. All right, so Professor Kimelo, thank you very much again for this second session. My pleasure. And My pleasure. Yeah, and we will go to our last speaker for today, Dr. Camporota, based in London, UK. So I will give you the floor now, and the screen is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Could you hear me okay? Yeah. Perfect. So good evening or good morning. It depends where you are in the world, but uh, it is a pleasure to be here. And um, uh, it's a difficult task after two great speakers about uh, mechanical ventilation in COVID, but I'm going to move a little bit forward and going to consider the ECMO side. So the extracorporeal membrane oxygenation in these patients. So just very quickly review global data. I mean, you don't need me to say that unfortunately the number of cases is increasing and the number of deaths uh, is increasing as well. This is worldwide taken from this morning at 7.20 uh, uh, UK time. But if we think about the um, mortality, for example, if we think about all the initial reports uh, in major journals in the previous wave, so the wave one, you can see, first of all, the number of ventilated patients. You can see the, the average PF ratio, but you can see the wide variety and variability in mortality rate for the completed episodes, not for the total episodes, but the ones who either died or were discharged from the intensive care. Because you can see at the time when the original presentations and, and uh, papers were published, most of the patients were still in the intensive care, so they had an undetermined outcome. And this is quite important, I think, when we think about outcomes uh, in, during the beginning of a pandemic, at the middle or the end. And the reason why I'm pointing this out because you will see later on that this has made a quite an important impact on the way we thought about administering ECMO worldwide. So, so that's the other thing. You, you can see the variability also in the pressure support that was required. So you can see the various studies, uh, the percentage of patients who received mechanical ventilation, you can see quite wide variability from 21% to 90% of patients receiving invasive mechanical ventilation. Equally variable when available was the percentage of patients who received prone positioning. And you can see there the number of patients requiring ECMO. So the percentage is, um, uh, you can see that uh, from zero to 11%, but on average about two, 3% of these patients went on to receive ECMO. Okay, this is our own data at uh, Geyser St. Thomas's. So first of all, we had during the wave, first wave, let's call it, so let's say February, March until later on uh, June, we had about 350 patients in total. <clears throat> you can see that 81.6% were ventilated, but we are a supra-regional ECMO center. And therefore we had 17, almost 18% of all, all our inpatients within the intensive care uh, were receiving ECMO. So it's a significant amount. And you can see that in the graph, the, uh, the total bed occupancy for COVID-19 in the red line, you can see the amount or the invasive, um, sort of the bed occupancy for invasive mechanical ventilation. But also you can see the total bed occupancy in green for the ECMO beds. So it's definitely not insubstantial, um, at least for a supra-regional center. 
And it makes sense because <clears throat> if you look at the ELSO registry, the number of patients who are receiving ECMO, the number of runs worldwide is increasingly, I think there is no exaggeration to say that is exponential, the increase. This is just respiratory ECMO in adults uh, alone. So the question is why ECMO? <clears throat> well, it makes sense when you see a chest X-ray like that. I think the question is um, is almost redundant to ask because that is life saving. There is no gas exchange possible in those lungs, and the only gas exchange that will be possible will be through an extracorporeal lung. But I think generally. What we do is the ECMO for is just to reduce the intensity of mechanical ventilation. I mean, Professor Gattinon and Professor Cumello earlier on have described really well the importance of the intensity of the mechanical ventilation that can be quantified by means of mechanical power, for example. So that is one of the reasons, the main reasons we use uh, ECMO. And generally, we can. Um, distinguish uh, the use of extracorporeal support primarily for hypoxemia or primarily for hypercapnia. Now the major uh, reason for using ECMO in COVID-19 was on your left hand side of the screen which was hypoxemia and again the second level of decision making is the presence of a hemodynamic compromise so the presence of shock or the presence or the absence of shock so it is very clear that in the hypoxemia in the absence of significant shock then clearly vena venous ecmo is the modality of choice and in fact you can see later on that that was the case for the vast majority of patients with, uh, with COVID-19, very few patients required venoarterial ECMO or even fewer required a hybrid um, configuration, which is a venous arterial venous ECMO. So that's when the venous is access and the uh, return or the reinfusion cannulae are separated into one arterial component and one venous component. But as I said, <clears throat> the majority of the reason why we use venous venous ECMO is the capability of ECMO to um, add oxygen to the system and remove carbon dioxide up to 100% of the metabolic um, requirements. And so we've got two possibilities. One is when ECMO is used as a rescue oxygenation, like the X-ray I've showed you before, or the one you can see at the bottom. But there is another ECMO <clears throat> requirement clearly increasing over time, which is that of exclusively the idea is to reduce the, is to reduce the, <clears throat> the intensity of mechanical ventilation and therefore give less ventilator induced lung injury. So these are the ECMO patients, you can see uh, we tend to do venous venous by a bifemoral approach. So you can see the two cannulae there from the femoral to the femoral, so vena venous. This is the L ECMO um, trend from the Euro ECMO COVID, which is basically an initiative from the Euro ELSO. And you can see, as I was saying earlier on, up to 92% or even greater number of patients uh, with COVID-19 required or, or at least received just venous venous, very small numbers, veno arterial. Now, as I was saying earlier on, the main reason <clears throat> is to reduce the intensity of mechanical ventilation and therefore ventilator induced lung injury. But clearly uh, uh, ECMO has got many other benefits. You can see there from improving oxygenation and therefore tissue hypoxia and the neurocognitive and psychiatric sequelae, but also carbon dioxide and all the hemodynamic consequences of carbon dioxide, which are important. And then later on is about the weaning side. And the consequences are the, a decrease in multiple organ failure and therefore decrease in mortality that we've seen in various other studies pre-COVID. 
And this is the amount that can be reduced. You can see this is a lifeguard, which is a, <clears throat> which is a, a apologies, this is a study, a observational study. You can see the mechanical power is um, being reduced by the use of ECMO by a significant degree, both in terms of respiratory rate and in terms of tidal volume. This is the same thing for the randomized control trial EOLIA, uh, which was published in the New England Journal in 2018. And this is a experimental study where it was possible to keep, um, this is, was an animal study, but essentially in near apneic conditions, just with ECMO. And that is the ultimate lung protective ventilation. What about in terms of patient selection? Well, when we think about ECMO, uh, we need to think about five questions. The first question is, is the pathology reversible? So this, for example, in this case is COVID-19 and that at the beginning in February, March, we didn't really know how much was reversible this pathology and what was the survivability of this pathology. Also, similarly, the second question is, is the patient able to recover? Well, they seem to be similar, but actually they're very different. One refers to the disease and the other one refers to the patient. So the same disease can affect two patients with very different frailty score and very different ability to recover. So the two things are important. And this is about patient selection. And then there are three important questions that's to do with the timing and the indication of ECMO. So the third one, is gas exchange severe and life-threatening? Clearly, if that is the case, ECMO is a rescue therapy needs to be um, provided because clearly uh, otherwise um, life cannot be sustained. And then other questions are about how injurious is mechanical ventilation. We said that one of the effects of ECMO is to reduce the intensity of mechanical ventilation. Therefore, that is an important question. And then finally, but um, equally important, is what is the right modality? So there's nothing worse than putting the right patient uh, on the wrong modality of ECMO. And as I said, 92% of the patients worldwide required just being of venous ECMO, uh, not any other forms. So now when we started the first wave, there was some uh, following the initial statistics and recommendation, the WHO recommended that essentially ECMO should be provided only in expert centers with sufficient experience or expertise and significant volume. And that should be provided when um, protective mechanical ventilation could not be achieved or possible. But at that time, as I mentioned before, there was the recognition that mortality was unknown. And some of the initial reports gave mortality even greater than 90%. So how to best utilize this um, very finite and highly invasive and specialized resource was not at all clear at that time. And I hope I'll be able to give you some data uh, to, to so see whether we can answer that question today. So one of the um, things uh, and ideas that came to light was a framework to prioritize ECMO indications. So how can we prioritize the type of patient uh, that might require or might benefit from ECMO the most? And so therefore there were some tiers. You can see a tier one with an expected survival greater than 60%. Tier two and tier three. And you can see that COVID and single organ failure was considered a tier one indication. So that meant that at that time, if organ failure was a single organ failure, so just the lung, the predicted survival was greater than 60%. And clearly, as the uh, number of organs involved increased, then the tier decreased to, to uh, up to mortality greater than 70%, you can see below.
So what we've done in the UK and uh, in Scotland, we had a centralized system, uh, an ECMO national referral pathway, uh, which came through a centralized system. You can see this is the platform and you could receive a number of uh, referrals. You could click on that referral and see all the details. And then you could discuss with the referral center, you could give advice and um, et cetera, or you could just go and retrieve the patient. We do, we did basically 100% of the patients were on mobile ECMO, so retrieved on ECMO already. We used at the beginning a modified indications as per the EOLIA trial, I'm sure you're all familiar with, but essentially there was a, a severity domain of hypoxemia uh, and a time domain. So a very severe PF ratio for um, three hours or more, or a less severe PF ratio, but more prolonged, or alternatively, hypercapnia with acidemia, despite a high respiratory rate and optimized ventilation. But we had to modify that a little bit during the first wave. And this is what uh, the, the criteria, the NHS, the National Health System had published. <clears throat> and <clears throat> you can see that that was other things involved. So patients had to have failed prone positioning or PEEP strategy. They had to have a certain clinical frailty scare and <clears throat> the rest score that I'll show you in a second had to be less than three or equal than three. And if that was not the case, then uh, we had to get opinion from other centers so we could be sure that the, uh, the patient with the best chances of survival or that could benefit the most could be offered uh, extracorporeal support. So this is the RESP score. You can go online and Google RESP score uh, in ECMO and you can do your own calculation and then you'll get a reps, reps, uh, RESP score. Uh, the greater the RESP score, the better the outcome. Uh, so that is one of important consideration. So these are the numbers that we got in the United Kingdom. So you can see on your left hand side, there were the number of referrals, each uh, color bar is one ECMO center. So what you can see here, the, the incredible increase going from March to April, April in terms of the number of referrals. So in the UK, we, we had almost 1,200 referrals per uh, for ECMO in the month of April alone. And you can see there those um, graphs line there. You can see that um, per center, there were up to 20 or 25 referrals per day for a quite prolonged period of time. And you can see that normally that's our usual referral line. So we get on average about one or two patients per day throughout the year. So that was a, almost a 20 fold increase in the number of referrals that uh, arrived to an ECMO center. So that's, this is the <clears throat> daily snapshot that we get um, uh, from a national referral. And you can see the normal, normally um, we are about 28 contemporaneous patients uh, uh, per um, uh, UK's, all the UK center. And this, this time we were up to 88. And now you can see at the bottom there, the first wave coming from March, beginning of March up to the end of uh, June, and then going downwards. And now you can see that there is the second wave, the second peak, uh, which is by no means the same height or the same speed. You can see the slope is much flatter and the numbers are not as high, but still there is a second wave nonetheless. Now, uh, as of um, last week, the criteria have changed again for us. You can see that here. There are some inclusion criteria for referral, and then there are some additional consideration for the ECMO centers. And what you can see is in bold, you can see some of the referral criteria that um, are similar to the EOLIA trial, 
but also there are some um, um, more detailed um, uh, additional um, considerations that patients need to go through. And then there will be the effect of uh, potential for lung recovery. So we still use the RESP score, uh, and, but we do not um, take so much into consideration the frailty score. Most of the patients are young and most of the patients are quite fit and generally well beforehand. Um, so what about outcome? Well, this is taken from today's snapshot from the EuroELSA website. You can see that there have been on um, um, 2,550 confirmed COVID-19 that have been initiated on ECMO about 90 days ago and the in-hospital mortality is about 44%. This is for all the centers. You can see the split uh, down here, you can see about 44% died in red. You can see how many were discharged, about 20%. Uh, others are discharged in LTAC, so a long-term hospital, or uh, a few of them are unknown, and a small percentage are still hospitalized. So this is quite important, but we'll see later on how this is a data that comes from a, again, from the Extracorporeal Life Support Organization that was published in The Lancet not very long ago. And essentially what they found, they found uh, 1, 000, more than 1,000 patients for, from 213 hospitals in 36 countries. You can see the age on average is what we normally see, about 49, 51 year old, mostly are male and mostly are overweight or obese, uh, at least based on BMI. And what you can see here that the majority of patients got a PEEP that is quite moderate or high, about 14, 15 centimeters of water and they're on FiO2 between 0.9 and 1. But what is interesting also is that uh, two out of three got prone positioning and similarly for neuromuscular blockade and one in three inhaled pulmonary vasodilators before receiving ECMO. So this is the same uh, paper you can see um, here, the, the discharged alive, about 34%, and you can see uh, the in-hospital death and a small percentage of patients were still in the ICU. Now, this is the UK data. So we treated over that period of time on the first wave, about 216 patients on ECMO secondary to COVID-19. And we had a overall about 72 to 74% um, survival with a median duration of ECMO of 12 days. Now, I think this is a very important number. So if you keep that in mind, 72, 74% is very important because we did a study uh, for, uh, which was published not long ago uh, in July this year, where we looked at the um, six years of uh, <clears throat> pre-COVID, so looking at 1,200 patients roughly identified and 1,200 uh, um, data were analyzed. And what you can see is the survival rate is 74%. So what I'm trying to say is that the COVID-19 uh, had a survival rate which was almost exactly the same as ARDS or general respiratory failure from any other cause that were treated in the same place uh, in the previous six years. So this is an important point. This is our own detailed cases, um, which <clears throat> we published a few, few months ago, but essentially you can see this very similar distribution in demographics. They're mainly male, uh, 45, 52 year old, um, and you can see a RESP score generally above three and a PF ratio that is significantly below 100. So 61, about 65 or 61 um, millimeter of mercury. 
Now, I would like to draw your attention to one thing because this has been important in terms of outcome uh, apologies for um, COVID-19 ARDS in the work that's been published in The Lancet by Giacomo Graselli et al. But what you can see when we look at survivors and non-survivors, one of the things is very important is their, their hyperinflammatory state. So procalcitonin, for example, much higher in non-survivors than survivors. You can see D-dimers hugely uh, much higher, four or five times greater than, than survivors. And similar thing for troponin. So clearly some of these patients were much more inflamed uh, than, than the other ones. Now, I put together a little summary slide here. What you can see is when you take different cohorts, you can take the cohort from the ELSO, uh, from France, from GSTT, from where I work in London, and you look at the COVID-19, you can see that the variation in mortality is there, but essentially it's between 24 and 39% mortality with a PF ratio that is very similar. And I would say that it's not very different from all cause ARDS that is seen either in randomized controlled trials, so 35% uh, in the EOLIA, or 39% in the large observational lifeguard trial. So this is, a, for me, is one of the take home messages in this slide that um, patients who receive ECMO due to COVID-19 have the same outcome as all-cause ARDS or all-cause uh, respiratory failure. You can see that there. Obviously, there are patients who do or conditions that predispose to worse outcome, uh, but obviously age being one and other modes of um, ECMO, so certainly VA ECMO has got worse outcome than VV, uh, or pre-ECMO pre cardiac arrest, you can see there. But these are all post-doc, and obviously there is no clear validation yet. Um, I would say that what is missing and what we need at the moment is the long-term outcomes uh, for these patients. So we had to have clinically relevant and patient important outcomes, and we need to have a look in the future of all the relevant category of health, so the physical, the mental, the social, the global satisfaction with life, and particularly some of the subsets, the physical, which are present in ARDS, but they're not yet present in the COVID-19 by virtue of the fact that it's a very new disease. Uh, and with that, I would like to conclude with five points. Mainly, I think we need to have clear criteria and framework for use for the use of uh, ECMO. This is essential. <clears throat> we can see that ECMO is very effective in the management of refractory COVID ARDS, and it carries the same survival as the, all the other causes of ARDS who received ECMO in the past. And I think at organizational level, Clear surge plans and escalation of resources is paramount, uh, is clearly very important. And for that reason, is ECMO is best performed in high volume centers. This is important for patients, for staffing, and clearly for all the other patients who do not need ECMO, but they, they use uh, resources within the same hospital. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Camporota. That was really good. So, same as before to our audience, if there is any question, you can drop them on the question and answer section. As you saw before, the audience is not very active today. I think we're going towards the end of the week. <laughs> Well, you know, give them a time. I think ECMO is um, yeah. it's not done everywhere and some people have got different experience. Uh, you know, 
Can I ask a question to the participants? Can, can you tell me whether you've got any experience, whether you work in an ECMO center or not? Uh, and if you do, just put some numbers, how many patients with uh, COVID-19 have you looked after? Just in the question and answer, just um, put some numbers, mm -hmm. just to have an idea. Or say zero if you don't work in an ECMO center. <laughs> Just we want to test whether your keyboard is, is working. <laughs> exactly, that is a good one. Anyone? I don't know, but I did recover it now, zero. It's coming in the chat, you see that, right? Zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know, but I did. Okay, that's fine, yeah. Yeah. So that's pre-COVID and obviously post during COVID. I, really so the maybe session. I can ask a question um, when yeah. there is no other one. Um, the referrals you had so far, uh, were most of them already intubated and ventilated? So in a later stage of uh, COVID AIDS and how difficult is it to transfer those patients? Were they transferred on uh, mobile ECMOs or on... Uh, mechanical ventilation. Thank you very much for that question. So, yes, so most patients were vent uh, ventilated. Uh, so, so we most of the patients were ventilated on average about three, four days, uh, and obviously tried prone position and didn't work and other modalities. Some of the patients had received some non-invasive support for a few days beforehand. Uh, but then obviously when they required ECMO, we normally go to the hospital, uh, we place the, the patient on ECMO, and we'll retrieve them on mobile ECMO. So I think that's the, the, the best, um, uh, that's what we have done this time. Normally we do about 70, 80% mobile ECMO and maybe 20, 30% we do, we call it conventional retrieval, so or mechanical ventilation. I mean, we personally, within Geist St. Thomas's, we've treated more than 250 patients. We have not done any ECMO with any internal patients, but, but obviously we look after a population of more than 17 million people in the south of east of England. And so therefore we do a lot um, of, uh, of, of ECMO like any other center in the UK. I think I can see some other patient, people saying more than 200 patient mechanically ventilated zero, zero on ECMO. So yeah, that, I mean, that makes sense because <clears throat> you can see that if you're not a, a high volume center, probably you'll, you, won't, you wouldn't have done any. Uh, and you can see from the slide that uh, uh, I put forward at the beginning of the talk, you can see that the, the percentage varied a lot from 0%, uh, some centers to quite a lot of different centers. So it's set up specific and yeah. Good. So if you if you receive a request from a hospital that doesn't have ECMO, um, I believe that you will also be used as an advisory consultant board, right? So, do you? I mean, are there any let's say common things that you can uh, provide here to the audience in terms of questions that you would ask regularly or what um, would be important to consider before calling or when calling an ECMO center? Yes, <clears throat> well, thank you very much. I mean, first of all, I would say that as ECMO centers, we don't just do ECMO, we treat uh, severe respiratory failure patients. So we recognize that 
we see a lot of them, but some hospitals, maybe some smaller hospitals don't see a lot of them because they don't come very frequently. So I would say, say call any time you've got a patient that you are concerned about and you would like some advice. Uh, obviously they need to be, um, you know, they don't necessarily need to be severe if you want to discuss, for example, a ventilation strategy. And often um, some doctors from our intensivists from other hospitals, they call us just because they want to discuss a patient. Maybe a patient is a little difficult or mechanical ventilation doesn't quite make sense. So we'll do some assessment of lung mechanics at the bedside, uh, often over the phone or via video. And therefore we, some, we suggest the best or what we think is the best ventilatory management for that patient. Uh, we can suggest uh, other um, adjunctive therapies, for example, pulmonary vasodilators, prompt positioning, uh, or sometimes some medications like uh, um, dosage of um, steroids <coughs> or other drugs. So it doesn't have to be just for ECMO, <coughs> is for management of patients with severe respiratory failure in general. But going to one part of your question is, what is the most common uh, question or intervention is reviewing lung mechanics and optimizing ventilation. That happens um, pretty much all the time. Thank you. Very good. Any more questions, more comments? I think for the time being, this is it. Yeah. Okay, so Dr. Camprota, thank you very much. It was, it was very good. I'm receiving some parallel feedback and it was a very interesting session. Very good. Um, thank you for the three speakers to be with us today and last week. Um, I can say that uh, some feedback I received from last week, people was quite delighted with your sessions. So uh, that makes us happy because that means that these sessions and this this kind of um, you know interaction is is useful for for clinicians and uh, yeah we hope we can do more things in the future hopefully face to face that that's that's I think my dream your dream everybody's dream so but yeah let's keep it the way it is and um, and um, yeah thank you very much for for everything and thank you for being here is there any more comment no uh no the, there were some questions in the question and answers but i don't know whether you yeah but they were from the previous uh, sessions well, yes. a new oh no there is a new one oh there are one it didn't two... refresh at all <laughs> okay well i can um i can answer yeah. some of the questions how many referral were rejected and uh, what were the things you advised the caring team um, so sometimes they, okay, I can tell you the percentage. We normally take one in three to one in four patients for ECMO. Um, most of the time it's not because they are rejected as such, but because maybe with advice they get better, they improve, and therefore they don't need ECMO, which is always what we like. Um, and uh, some patients might not benefit from ECMO, so we have to say no because of futility, but mostly because we think that there is something else that can be done that doesn't require ECMO. And what are the common mistakes? I mean, sometimes it's not mistakes, it's just um, that um, going through a very rigorous assessment of lung mechanics and trying to give the, what you think is the best modality of ventilation, which sometimes is lower the peep, lower the peep, lower the peep, and some patients get better. And some other times it's anti-inflammatory, some other times it's, uh, I mean, it's variable, but most of the time it's about excessive PEEP in patients with a, a preserved compliance. So that's what I would say is number one. Any space for ECMO and non-intubation 
related? Well, very, very few um, indications, and mainly around lung transplant outside COVID-19. I would say most of the time they will have to be intubated, ventilated with optimal uh, treatment. So I would say probably in COVID-19, no, will have to be intubated. Uh, there is another one about what is the difference in providing ECM between younger patients and older patients. Um, and is there any circumstances where young patients are put into ECMO caused by COVID? Oh yes, there are plenty of young patients. I mean, you have seen that most of the patients were in their 40s and some in their 20s or 30s. So clearly young patients get uh, put into ECMO quite frequently. Now, in terms of older patients, I'm not quite sure what older patient means, but um, clearly some of the very old, much older patients, we know that the outcome uh, is not as good as younger patients and then tend to acquire comorbidities, they tend to acquire uh, frailty and organ failures. And in that case, they would sometimes they score quite low in terms of RESP score. Uh, and they've got less preference compared to the younger patients. But it's a case by case. There is no age cut and there is no prejudgment about age. Uh, but I will ha we'll have to have a look on a case by case. Okay, thank you. I think there are no more. Um, apologies to the audience. I <laughs> didn't have a refresh in my window. So no I was not seeing the questions coming through. Okay. Okay. So thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Camprota. Thank you, Pleasure. Professor thank you Cumelo. Much. Thank you, Professor Gattinoni. And um, yeah, have a really good evening. And I hope we talk very soon face to face.